An Unsocial Socialist by George Bernard Shaw Chapter 1 In the dusk of an October evening, a sensible-looking woman of forty came out through an oaken door to a broad landing on the first floor of an old English country house. A braid of her hair had fallen forward, as if she had been stooping over a book or pen, and she stood for a moment to smooth it, and to gaze contemplatively, not in the least sentimentally, through the tall, narrow window. The sun was setting, but its glories were at the other side of the house, for this window looked eastward, where the landscape of sheep walks and pasture land was sobering at the approach of darkness. The lady, like one to whom silence and quiet were luxuries, lingered on the landing for some time. Then she turned towards another door, on which was inscribed in white letters, Classroom Number Six. Arrested by a whispering above, she paused in the doorway and looked up the stairs along a broad, smooth handrail that swept round in an unbroken curve at each landing, forming an inclined plane from the top to the bottom of the house. A young voice, apparently mimicking someone, now came from above, saying, We will take the utudes de la velocite next, if you please, ladies. Immediately, a girl in a holland dress shot down through space, whirled round the curve with a fearless centrifugal toss of her ankle, and vanished into the darkness beneath. She was followed by a stately girl in green, intently holding her breath as she flew, and also by a large young woman in black, with her lower lip grasped between her teeth, and her fine brown eyes protruding with excitement. Her passage created a miniature tempest, which disarrayed anew the hair of the lady on the landing, who waited in breathless alarm until two light shocks and a thump announced the aerial voyagers had landed safely in the hall. "'Oh, la!' exclaimed the voice that had spoken before. "'Here's Susan!' "'It's a mercy your neck ain't broken,' replied some palpitating female. "'I'll tell of you this time, Miss Wiley. Indeed I will.' And you too, Miss Carpenter, I wonder at you, not to have any more sense at your age, with your size. Miss Wilson can't help hearing you, when you come down with a thump like that. You shake the whole house. Oh, bother, said Miss Wiley. The lady at best takes good care to shut out all the noise we make. Let us... Girls, said the lady above, calling down quietly, but with ominous distinctness. Silence and utter confusion ensued. Then came a reply in a tone of honeyed sweetness from Miss Wiley. "'Did you call us, dear Miss Wilson?' "'Yes, come up here if you please, all three. There was some hesitation among them, each offering the other precedence. At last they went up slowly, in the order, though not at all in the manner, of their flying descent. Followed Miss Wilson into the classroom, and stood in a row before her, illumined through three western windows with a glow of ruddy orange light. Miss Carpenter, the largest of the three, was red and confused. Her arms hung by her sides. Her fingers twisted the folds of her dress. Miss Gertrude Lindsay, in pale sea green, had a small head, delicate complexion, and pearly teeth. She stood erect, with an expression of cold distaste for a proof of any sort. The holland dress of the third offender had changed from yellow to white as she passed from the gray eastern twilight on the staircase into the warm western glow in the room. Her face had a bright olive tone, and she seemed to have a golden mica in its composition. Her eyes and hair were hazelnut color, and her teeth, the upper row of which she displayed freely, were like fine Portland stone, and sloped outward enough to have spoilt her mouth, had they not been supported by a rich uh, under lip, and a finely curved, impudent chin. Her half-cajoling, half-mocking air and her ready smile were difficult to confront with severity, and Miss Wilson knew it, for she would not look at her even when attracted by a convulsive start and an angry side glance from Miss Lindsay who had just been indented between the ribs by a fingertip. "'You are aware that you have broken the rules,' said Miss Wilson quietly. 
"'We didn't intend to. We really did not,' said the girl in Holland, coaxingly. "'Pray, what was your intention, then, Miss Wiley?' Miss Wiley unexpectedly treated this as a smart repartee instead of a rebuke. She sent up a strange little scream, which exploded in a cascade of laughter. "'Pray, be silent, Agatha,' said Miss Wilson severely. Agatha looked contrite. Miss Wilson turned hastily to the eldest of the three and continued, "'I am especially surprised at you, Miss Carpenter, since you have no desire to keep faith with me by upholding the rules, of which you are quite old enough to understand the necessity. I shall not trouble you with reproaches or appeals to which I am now convinced that you would not respond.' Here Miss Carpenter, with an inarticulate protest, burst into tears. "'but you should at least think of the danger "'into which your juniors are led by your childishness. "'How should you feel if Agatha had broken her neck?' "'Oh!' exclaimed Agatha, putting her hand quickly to her neck. "'I didn't think there was any danger,' said Miss Carpenter, "'struggling with her tears. "'Agatha has done it so o "'Oh, dear, you have torn me!' "'Miss Wiley had pulled at her schoolfellow's skirt "'and pulled too hard. "'Miss Wiley,' said Miss Wilson, flushing slightly. I must ask you to leave the room. Oh, no, exclaimed Agatha, clasping her hands in distress. Please don't, dear Miss Wilson. I am so sorry. I beg your pardon. Since you will not do what I ask, I must go myself, said Miss Wilson sternly. Come with me to my study, she added to the two other girls. If you attempt to follow Miss Wiley, I shall regard it as an intrusion. But I will go away if you wish it. I didn't mean to dis- I shall not trouble you now. Come, girls. The three went out, and Miss Wiley, left behind a disgrace, made a surpassing grimace at Miss Lindsay, who glanced back at her.